Let's go ahead and open in prayer, shall we? Abba Father, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we just want to bless you and thank you for another great week and the opportunity to come before you. It's a privilege, Abba, to be able to get out of bed each morning on the Shabbat and praise your name and thank you for taking us out of this world on this day and giving us this day of rest. And Abba, not just that, but to come together and to fellowship with your people, your chosen, your anointed ones, Abba, your... Um, priesthood, Abba, that is coming to try to understand your word more and more. I pray, Abba, that you will unleash your word today for the edification of this body. And I pray, Yahweh, that you'll use me in an honorable way to speak only truth, Abba, and not say anything that is not of your word. So we just want to bless you and thank you, and we invite you now, Yahweh, to be here with us, to commune with us in your spirit and in your word and show us Yahweh again what is your heart in your word and help us to become more edified as days goes on and also Yahweh to share, share that edification with one another especially for those that are not feeling well and are down, downtrodden and outcast Abba and we pray for those that could not be here this week that you'll bring them back next week Abba so refresh them and help them in Yeshua's mighty name, amen. amen. So, last week we started in Genesis 1. And during the next few days after that, I was praying to Yahweh about what seemed to be logical, which is we go to Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 3. Seemed to be logical to me, seemed to make sense to me. But oftentimes what happens with me, uh, Yahweh turns the boat around in a kind of a different direction. And so what happened was, as I was praying, he told me to go look for something, but he, he didn't tell me what it was. So it was kind of like a wild goose chase. I was looking, and that happens a lot for me anyway. I don't know about for you guys, but it's kind of like he, he gives me a clue that there's something waiting for me to discover. And I, but he doesn't always tell me what it is. It's kind of like being married. Women's kind of hint around, but they're never really specific about what it is they want you to do. So you kind of got to guess at it. Um, so yeah, I, I got a few. I'll tell you what, afterwards, if you guys are down and out that bad, we'll get together as men and we'll, we'll cry on each other's shoulders. I know the feeling. But anyway, uh, all kidding aside, he gave me something to look for. So I started searching. And then I found it. And it was summed up in one word. And the word was, again. And I had read this scripture many times over the years and never saw the word again. At least not consciously in my reading. And I passed over it, never making a connection as to what that was actually referring to. And I'll get to that in a little bit. But before I get into the actual message, this message is going to really be dealing with the pre-existence of the Word. We talked a little bit afterwards last week and hinted around a little bit, and I think that was the genesis of what's today's message, which is to explore this a little bit further. Who is this Word? And let's look at some of the dynamics of its pre-existence before Genesis 1. And so it would seem that this really should have been the first message before starting Genesis. But, okay, I caught on late, but we're going to do it this time before we go to verse 3, which hopefully will be next week. Some years ago, I was at an art festival with my wife, and we were walking around. It was a nice sunny day, spring day. And as I was walking down, there were booths all in a row of all artists showing their wares and so forth. As we're walking down, I see from the back this girl sitting on a bar, what looked like kind of like a bar stool with long black hair. It's a slim girl and she's sitting there on there with her hands kind of like this holding on to the seat itself. So her shoulders were kind of up a bit. I go, well that's kind of strange. So as I walk closer and closer I noticed she wasn't moving. So then as I walked around the other side I saw that this was a girl that was made by the artist a self-portrait of this girl, but it was an actual sculptor. The amazing thing about this girl was she looked so real that if she would have moved, she would have been real, but she didn't move, and that was the tip-off. 
you could literally see the pores in her skin. You could see little deep dimples. You could see little freckle marks, light, light blonde hair on her hands on, 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 in certain places, the eyes. Everything was so amazing in the way that it looked. And it looked exactly like the artist that had created this girl. And I thought to myself in this message, what was Yahweh thinking, the father thinking when he decided he was going to begot or birth a son? And I'm not talking about the son Yeshua in the physical sense. I'm talking about the Logos, the word, who would become Yeshua later on. And what that must have been like. And so I also thought to myself, how, how does Yahweh take like we speak and the words project out of our mouths. How does Yahweh take that and create it into an image and say, this is my son, before he even comes in the flesh? And it's a really, really strange thing to think about because he did this before Genesis 1. We're going to go through some stuff, and some of it's going to be a little bit of a mind twister. And I hope that you'll humor me a little bit and take a look at what some of the things are that I've discovered. And I think they're very interesting to take a look at. So I call it the pre-existence. So this message would be basically the pre-existence. This is what we're going to kind of deal with. In the beginning was the word, as we read in John chapter 1. So let's go through that, shall we? In the beginning was the first principal rule that was the word, or the logos, the thought expressed in spoken communication, which is what I just said. Yahweh spoke out of his mouth and somehow, I don't know how he did that, but he took that word and he created it into an image. And he called it his son, long before he came here in the flesh. That must have been an amazing thing to be able to witness if you were so privileged to be able to do so. But he took his spoken communication and he made it into an image. And the word was by the side of. I thought this was interesting in the Greek. The pros means the actual side of Yahweh. And the word yet was Yahweh. And we could say Yahweh is like a family name. Yahweh has no beginning. This would imply at some point Yahweh made his word to be at his right side. And we're going to take some look at some interesting aspects of that as we go along as well. So in verse 2 he says, He was in the beginning with Yahweh. But what was the beginning? We think that in Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 1, that was the beginning. Yes, he was with him at that point when the creation of the physical universe was started. But as we went through last week, we see that the angelic realm was actually created before the physical universe was created. So is that really the beginning? Or is the beginning really prior to any creation that Yahweh had ever formulated outside of himself? Because the word needed to be in existence in order to create these things. So logic would dictate that in the beginning is when the word was actually formulated and begotten as his son, who would then be the one who is the author and finisher of all this creation and everything that was done in it from beginning to end. Notice that the word was already by Yahweh's side in the beginning. This is a reference to when Yahweh decided to create outside of himself by the side of the word pros in the Greek. So it means by the side. Verse 3, all things were made through him, Yeshua in other words, and without him nothing was made that was made. And in him was life, and life was the light of men. Verse 5, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend or possess the light. So um, clearly the darkness has no authority over light whatsoever. So the question, when did the word become the sun? This is something that we usually don't really hear much being talked about, but it, it did happen. And I'm not talking again about in the flesh, I'm talking about in the spirit before the creation. So apparently it would seem that before the creation is when this sun was begotten. 
In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 5 through 6, we see here, For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today? In other words, present tense. Currently, at this moment, I have begotten as offspring, as a father, to you. So clearly we know that he never said that to any of the angels, which is where the JWs have a big problem because they believe that Jesus is Michael the angel, and this clearly refutes that. And again, I will be or exist to him a father, and he shall be and follow afterwards to me a son. Verse 6, but when he again, by repetition once more, brings, by introducing the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of Yahweh worship him. This is the second time this happened. So it happened the first time in the spirit realm. And then when he came in the flesh, it's the second time that he was begotten in the flesh. So it's happened twice, once in the spirit and once in the flesh. Notice the word again. Yahweh begot the word prior to creation and again in the flesh. The Father introduced him as the word or logos or spokesperson in the Tanakh as Yeshua in the flesh. Let's go back. I want to see something here. And again, notice right here. Oh, sorry. Went the wrong way. And again, breaking in halfway, I will be to him a father. So he speak, if he's saying the word again, it means it's repetitious. He's doing it more than once. It didn't happen just once. It's happened twice. Otherwise, he wouldn't use the word again. So I thought that was the interesting word because I had never noticed that before. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, where are we? Okay, in Psalms 110, verses 1 through 6, it says, Then the greater Yahweh said to my lesser Yahweh, remember, this is King David repeating a prior conversation between two Elohims. So this is not a present tense conversation. This is a conversation that had happened in the pre-existence of creation. Okay, we got that? David's just repeating this conversation. This is what's going on. Sit as judge at my right hand as the stronger hand. Remember now, the context here is that Yahweh that we know as the Father, the greater Yahweh, is the stronger. This is the implication. Yahweh, is, the Father, is the stronger. So sit at the right hand of the one who's the stronger. It's not that the word or the Logos or the one who becomes Yeshua is the stronger. It's the Father that's the stronger. So you're sitting at his right hand. Till I make your enemies your footstool uh, to stomp into pieces. The word footstool literally means to stomp into pieces. That's the purpose of it. Uh, verse 2, Yahweh, the greater, shall send the rod for chastising which is Yeshua, of your David's strength out of Zion, which is in heaven. He's going to come from out of heaven because the context here is when Yeshua returns the second time and he destroys all the enemies that have come against Jerusalem. That's the context of this. As to tread down to subjugate in the midst or the center of your enemies. So it's a prophetic type of verse. Verse 3. Your people will be shall be volunteers in spontaneity in the day of your power, or the day of great wrath when he returns, in the beauties of holiness, of glorious splendor. From the womb of the morning, you have the dew. The dew is like a cloud. So this cloud or dew is the beauty of his splendor, okay, that covers of your youth. Verse 4, Yahweh has sworn as a repeating declaration and will not relent or be sorry. You are a priest or a Kohenim, a, uh, a Kohen Gahagadal, as a chief priest forever. Um, a time of uh, forever, and the word to forever means time out of mind. In other words, in our infinite way of thinking or our finite way of thinking, we don't have the capacity to understand what that time actually is. We just don't have a reference for it. That's what it means. According to the order of Melchizedek, king of the right. That's what Melchizedek means. Verse 5, Yahweh, the lesser, 
is at your right hand as the stronger. In other words, Yahweh the Father is the stronger, so he's at the right hand. He, the lesser Yahweh, shall execute kings in the day of his wrath, breathing passion through his nostrils. So apparently he's going to be extremely upset when he's returning to the earth because all these nations have not only rebelled against him, they've come against Jerusalem and they're treading down the holy city and now it's time to deal with them. Verse 6, he shall judge and execute law among the nations. So the word judge means to execute law. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads, uh, the shaking of the head of many countries. So clearly, if we look at this, we can clearly see this is talking about the time when Yeshua returns the second time when he comes to take out his wrath on all the nations. So let's take a look at 2 Samuel verses, uh, chapter 7, verse 1 through 16. And I'm going to give here a basically a father-son type of analogy. Because what we're seeing in this text is a father-son type of analogy. But it also not only applies to David, but it also applies to the father as he speaks to the word, the Logos, or the one who becomes Yeshua. It's kind of like an analogy or a type. So let's go through this. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to go a little bit slower with this because it really plays with your mind. And what I tried to do as best as I could, humanly speaking, is to try to interject the names after what's being stated so that we can try and understand who it is, the identity of who it is that is actually being spoken about in that particular phrase. Now, the problem here is at first you have kind of like the word doing the speaking, but then later on it begins to shift to where the word is speaking but from the father's perspective as we would understand the father's perspective. So. I probably didn't do it great justice, but just follow along with me and hopefully we can understand what's going on here. So, now it came to pass in verse 1 when the king, who David is a kind of Yeshua, he's a king, okay, was dwelling in his house and Yahweh the Father had given him David, or the type of Yeshua, rest from all his enemies around. And when we think about it, Yahweh says, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. When Yeshua defeated everybody, everything here on this earth, and he went to be back with the Father, he sat at Yahweh's right hand. And so in a sense, you could say, this is kind of partially in a fulfillment of this, at least in that way, because what happens is he got his rest from his enemies. He defeated his enemies. He defeated Hasatan, which gave him legal right to be king and sit at the right hand of the Father. So right now, he's at rest. He's not happy, but he's at rest. He doesn't have to fight that war. And so the final rest will be when he comes back and destroys all the nations that come against Jerusalem, and then there will be peace on the earth, and then he'll have his rest. So let's move on. Verse 2, that the king, David, or Yeshua, said to Nathan, which is a kind of messenger, or Ruach, the prophet, see now, I... David, Yeshua, dwell and sit as a judge in a house of cedar. But the ark of Yahweh, the lesser Yahweh, and I'm going to get into a little bit more of this in a minute. There's an important distinction that we have to make about this. Dwells inside tent uh, curtains. Note that ex the, the earthly ark or throne of the word Yeshua was a pattern of the heavenly ark or throne of Yahweh the Father. So what's in heaven, we have also on earth as a pattern or a type. So we need to keep that in mind. Verse 3, Then Nathan, messenger type of Ruach, said to the king David, Yeshua, Go, do all that is in your heart, for Yahweh the Father is with you. So David had the Father's endorsement, so to speak, to go do what he had to do. And in the same way, Yeshua has the endorsement of the Father to do what he's got to do. So there's kind of like a parallel going on here. And I take this from the New Testament because it was quoted, uh, I don't remember where, I think it's in Acts uh, somewhere. This whole part of this whole series was quoted from there. So I'm using this analogy based upon what was said there. I should have included it, but I forgot. Forgive me, it was getting too long. Anyway, in verse 4, But it happened that night that the Word, who is Yeshua of Yahweh, Yeshua, came to Nathan, the messenger of the Ruach, saying, verse 5, Go and tell my servant David, Yeshua. Thus says Yahweh, the word Yeshua, 
would build a house for me, which is the word of Yeshua, to dwell and sit as judge therein. See, remember that at this point in time, Yahweh as manifested as the word or Yeshua is not sitting on the Ark of the Covenant. This is what's going on. So he's looking for a place for him to be <coughs> and to sit in this house. And so let's move on. It can't be the Father sitting in the house. It cannot be the Father. Many people would say it would be the Father that was sitting in this house, but it's not so, and I'm going to show you why. In Acts chapter 7, verse 48 through 50, it says, Moreover, the Most High, the Most High that is the Father, the greater Yahweh, does not dwell in temples made with hands, which is constructed by humans, as the prophet says. Heaven is my, the Father has spoken through Yeshua's throne, my stately seat of power, the, and the earth is my footstool. So Yahweh is clearly making two distinctions here. One, he does not dwell in anything made by man's hands. He only dwells by power in the heavenly seat that's up there. And number two, he declares that the earth is his footstool. Two important distinctions that we have to make. What house will you build for me, says Yahweh, or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all of these things? Notice that the earth is the Father's footstool, but the enemies are Yeshua's footstools in Psalms 110.1. Let me read it again. Then the greater Yahweh said to my lesser Yahweh, Sit as judge at my right hand, as the, strength, the stronger hand, till I make your enemies your footstool. So and here he's making another distinction. That Yeshua's footstools is not the earth, but his footstool is the enemies who live on the earth. That's his footstool because he's going to trample them under his feet when he comes back to destroy them. So these are important distinctions. Let's move on. No one has seen or heard the Father at any time. Let's look at John chapter 1 verse 18. No one, not even one man, has seen, discerned clearly or experienced an appearance of Yahweh the Father at any time. The only begotten only born, son who is in the bosom or the lap of the father, he declares out, of, uh, out loud about him, in other words, the father. So Yeshua clearly by these texts is telling us no man has ever seen the father nor heard his voice or anything like that, that Yeshua is the only one that can do that. And so we've got people that will say that um, Elijah and Enoch and all of them have gone to heaven before Yeshua. Well, if that's the case, they are men, and they would be able to, to declare that they've seen the Father if they went to heaven. I mean, to me, that would seem logical. But here we're being told very clearly that Yeshua alone reserves that right. After all, he came to reveal the Father, because the Father was not the one speaking in the Tanakh. It was the Word, the Logos, the spokesperson. It's sort of like when you go into a court of law to defend yourself or execute judgment or whatever. You don't go in representing yourself. You go in with a Logos, an attorney. And he's the one who represents your case because there's a rift between two parties. In this particular case, mankind has a rift with the Father, going back to the garden. And so that rift has to be mended. And Yeshua is the one who is the mediator of the covenants to bring the two parties back together at the appropriate time. That's another discussion. Verse 37, And the Father himself who sent or dispatched on a temporary errand of me has testified, this is Yeshua speaking, testified or bore record of me. And we had that all through the Tanakh. He bore record of the Logos, the Word, the one who would become Yeshua in the flesh. We have plenty of records describing who he actually is and what he would do. You have neither heard in your ear or in an audience of his voice at any time, nor seen his form, shape, or appearance. In Matthew 3, 17, do we have an exception? Because it would appear to be an apparent, what I call an apparent contradiction. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. 
clearly there's got to be the Father. And it's saying, and it's in quotes, he's talking. So how do we explain that? Especially since the fact that Yeshua is here, and he's not with the Father, so he's not acting from the spirit realm as the spokesman, because he's here in the flesh doing this job. So how did they hear this voice, or is John hallucinating when he makes those texts say that no man at any time has ever seen him, his former heard his voice? Well, we have an explanation. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2 through 3, it says, For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by Yahweh and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. So clearly we have a reference here where angels, and we know that angels are messengers. We have plenty of scriptures for precedence to tell us that angels come and do the bidding of Yahweh and deliver messages to men. Anyway, let's continue back to 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1 through, uh, let's starting in verse 6. We'll pick up. So, Again, let, I'll try to go slow because this is a continuing thought. For I, the word, Yeshua, that's the one who's speaking, have not dwelt and sit as judge in a house since the time that I, the word, Yeshua, brought the children out of Israel up from Egypt. Even to this day, but have moved about in a tent in a tabernacle, a shepherd's hut. So a tabernacle is kind of like a shepherd's hut. That's what it is. Verse 7, whenever I, the word Yeshua, have moved about with all the children of Israel, have I, the word Yeshua, ever spoken a word to anyone from the tribes of Israel, whom I, the word Yeshua, commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, why have you not built for me, and the me is the word or Yeshua, a house of cedar? This is not the Father speaking. This is the word Yeshua, okay? as its roots hold together with strength. The reason why he uses the word cedar is because the cedar tree has an extensive root system which goes deep into the ground and it has the ability to hold on with a lot of strength and is not moved very easily. So that's why the cedar was used. Let's move on, verse 8. Now therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, Yeshua, the type of Yeshua, thus says Yahweh, the word Yeshua of host, a company of persons organized for worship and war. That's what that means, sobah, in, in Hebrew. I, the word Yeshua, took from you, uh, took from the sheepfold, took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people over Israel. And so note that there's a time for all of us as believers in Yeshua, we're all in a sheepfold. We're all sheep, we're learning, we're growing and so forth. But there comes a point in time where sometimes Yahweh should be taking us out of the sheepfold and you go from being a sheep to where you become some sort of a leader in whatever ministry Yahweh has placed you into. It's about developing that craft, so to speak, honing in on what has Yahweh called you to be? What has he called you to do? And so for David, he was a sheep herder. But then there came a moment when the time was right that Yahweh took him out from herding the sheep, and now he's going to literally shepherd the house of Israel. Let's move on. Verse 9, And I, the word Yeshua, have been with you wherever you have gone, and have cut off as my covenant agreement all your enemies from before you, and have made you a great name as a mark of authority like the name of the great men who are on the earth. Verse 10, Moreover, I, the word Yeshua, will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them that they may dwell, reside permanently in a place of their own, and move no more. Nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress or browbeat them any more as previously since the time that I, the word Yeshua, commanded judges to be over and the word over in the Hebrew has the implication who leaned towards being against Israel. In other words, they were hard on Israel. And that's because Israel was a very rebellious nation at the time. And so these judges enacted punishment on Israel. It was very difficult for them. So this word over has the connotation of being like heavy handed on them, so to speak, if I could use that. My people Israel and have caused you to rest. So 
even though it was heavy handed on them, eventually it led them to where they could get to a rest because King David came along and have caused you to rest or settle down from all your enemies. Also, Yahweh, the word Yeshua, tells boldly in front of you that he will make you a house. When, in other words, the house of Israel. That's what it's talking about. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I, the word Yeshua, will set up your seed, who is Yeshua, because the seed will come through David, after you, as it states here, who will come from your body. So this is speaking about David. Uh, and it's interesting because it can have the connotation either way. In this case, it would be from the man's perspective, but it could mean from the uterus or the seed of generation, the loins of man where procreation takes place. And I will establish his kingdom. Verse 13, he shall build a house for my name, and I, the word Yeshua, will establish the throne of his David, or Yeshua's kingdom forever. And it's kind of one and the same. So when the millennium comes... The kingdom of Yahweh will be set up and it will be the throne of David, which Yeshua will sit on that throne. Here the word Yeshua is speaking on behalf of the creator, Yahweh the Father. Notice the change in dialogue that takes place. I, the Father, as spoken through the word Yeshua, will be his father, Yahweh, and he shall be my son. So clearly we're talking father-son relationship now. And it's the one who's the head or the stronger is the one that's making this statement about the son. Be my son David Yeshua. If he commits iniquity, I, the father, has spoken through the word Yeshua. Will, and remember, the reason why I'm phrasing it like this is because the father does not speak directly. But he speaks through the word who is Yeshua. So that's why I'm putting that there in case you're wondering. Will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. So let's look at, uh, let's, let's look at another example here of a father-son. And we see this in Psalms chapter 2, verse 1 through 12. It says, Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain by murmuring in anger thing? And so uh, Pedro had brought up a good discussion a few weeks ago about murmuring against Yahweh. And this is that, that word, dagah. I guess that's how you would say that, dagah, something like that. And that's the implication is murmuring with the intent of being angry. Verse 2, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh the Father. And against his anointed, which is the word, Yeshua, saying. See, so we got two personages here in this text. Three, let us, the father's son, break their bonds. See, now they're being inclusive. They're not separate. They're being inclusive. Uh, let us break their bonds or halter. It's kind of like the halter a horse wears. Let's break that in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Verse 4, he who sits in the heavens shall laugh and make sport of. So the implication in the Hebrew here is that Yahweh is going to look down at what these nations are doing and he's going to laugh at them and he's going to mock them. And look how he does it. Yahweh shall hold them in derision. And the word derision, la'og, uh, la means by imitating a foreigner to mock him. And we've seen people who uh, hear somebody with a foreign way of speaking in English, for example, and you imitate their accent, you know, and, and you kind of mock them and make fun of them. And that's the implication with the word derision that Yahweh's going to do it. He's going to be laughing and he's going to be mocking them at the same time by imitating the way they talk. So it's kind of like, ha, 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 you believe these guys down here on the earth? And probably you got a king that has a funny accent. Maybe Yahweh might even be imitating that accent, mocking what that king is saying that he's going to do, knowing what Yeshua is going to do to him when he returns. So there is humor in heaven, and Yahweh does laugh when there, the time is appropriate for that. Anyway, let's move on. Verse 5, Then he, the word Yeshua, shall speak to them in his wrath a rapid breathing of passion through the nostrils, and distress, which is an inward trembling of them in his deep displeasure. Verse 6, Yet I, the Father, as spoken through the word Yeshua, have set my king, the word Yeshua, on my holy hill of Zion. That's in heaven. 
So it's not speaking of David in this context. This is speaking of the one who will become Yeshua, the one who before the creation was begotten as a son and was told to sit at his right hand, who's a, which is the permanent capital. And it is the permanent capital because even though Jerusalem is the capital here on earth, the heavenly Jerusalem is the capital of infinite space. And we know that in Revelation, when Yeshua has completed all his work here on the earth, and the earth is burned up in a ball of fire and is purified, and there is no more flesh, and there's no more rebellion on the earth, the heavenly Jerusalem will descend from the third heavens down to the earth, and the capital of the universe will be right here on the earth. And we will tabernacle with the Father for the first time. At least those in the second and the third harvest, not the first harvest. That's another study. Yahweh, the Father, has spoken through Yeshua has said to me, the word Yeshua, so now it's me, it's Yeshua, the word Yeshua who's speaking. You are my son. Today, I, Yahweh the Father, have begotten as to bear you. Verse 8, ask, inquire as a demand of me, Yahweh the Father, and I, Yahweh the Father, will give you, the word Yeshua, the nations. This is clearly could only be talking about the Father. Is it could be nobody else. The nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. This is what whole Yeshua's work is all about. You, in verse 9, the word Yeshua, shall break them with a rod of iron that cuts. You, the word Yeshua, shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel by squeezing and molded uh, into a form. So if you ever watch a potter at a potter's wheel, he takes a lump of clay and he gets it all wet and he starts shaping it and molding it to what he wants. That's the, what the word here, a potter's vessel, means in the Hebrew. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. So now he's switching to talking, to admonishing the kings of the earth. Be instructed and intelligent, you judges that, govern, that are governors of the earth. Serve Yahweh with fear and rejoice. Spin around in violent emotion with trembling. In other words, prepare yourself. Because calamity is about to come upon you, and if you had any intelligence whatsoever, you will repent from your ways and spare yourself the destruction that's about to come upon you. Verse 12. Kiss the Son, the word Yeshua, as heir to the throne, lest he, the word Yeshua, be angry, breathe hard with enragement, and you perish in the way, which is the course of your life's path. When his wrath is kindled like a consuming by a fire, a, but a little, blessed are those, all those who put their trust by fleeing towards protection in him, the word Yeshua. That is today's message. And I hope that you were able to glean a little bit of uh, some interesting dialogues that were going on in there. And the fact that Yeshua pre-existed before the creation and was begotten twice. As we can clearly see from Scripture that Yeshua was begotten twice. Once before the existence of the creation who would be the one who brings creation into existence and another one when naturally he came here on the earth to die for our sins and redeem us from the curse which is the death of the law, the death from the law. So with that, I, I hope that everybody was able to get something out of there. It was uh, an interesting dis discovery for me to look into some of what was going on. So let's go ahead and close in prayer, shall we? Abba, Father, in the name of Yeshua, again, we just want to thank you and bless you for the privilege and the honor to be able to come here before your throne on this Sabbath and to commune with one another and with you and to seek your presence and to seek your will and to seek your understanding in what it is you are doing in your plan of salvation for your people, Israel, and for the world as a whole, Abba. And what the desires are of your heart that one day your dream, your desire is to be able to tabernacle with all of mankind that have accepted Yeshua and his sacrifice. And so, Yahweh, with that, we just want to bless you and thank you. 
And we ask, Yahweh, that you never leave or depart from us. We pray, Yahweh, for the rest of the body of Messiah, that you will encourage them and strengthen them, especially those, Yahweh, who are going through great trials and difficulties, and especially also those people who are isolated and don't have a fellowship where they can go to, where they can either be mentored or comforted by others, Abba, who've been around for a while that can help them through the difficulties of this life and through this walk. And so, Yahweh, we pray that the blood of Yeshua will continue to protect us from the evil that's in this world and deliver us from all temptations that the enemy tries to throw our way and preserve us until the day of the coming of Yeshua HaMashiach in His great wrath, Yahweh, where we will be able to come with Him as the host of heaven to wage that war and destroy the enemies of Israel. In Yeshua's mighty name, Amen.